Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Hello, it's Marin Somerset Webb here. We will start this week's show with an announcement. I will be at the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh once again this year, hosting four days of absolutely riveting conversations in Adam Smith's Pamir House. I will be there from August the 17th to August the 20th. Tickets are already on sale and going very fast. Don't forget that we sell out every single year. Links will be in the show notes. You can also just head to the main Fringe website and search for Merrin to see availability and purchase tickets. Plus, get some more information about the venue and have a think about who might be our guests, although we don't actually announce those until the very last minute. Do come if you haven't been before. It's a really nice time to be in Edinburgh. We always have a great time. And John will be there on a couple of days, which I think is just the thing to get you all in. Now back to our regular programming. This week on the show, Peter Kinsella joins us. He is the global head of FX strategy at Union Bancaire Privé, one of Switzerland's largest private wealth managers. And we talk about the attractiveness of the UK market right now, his outlook for sterling, and why he thinks it. Everybody should bet big on copper, which not everyone agrees on, by the way. But first, as always, senior reporter and author of Money Still Newsletter, John Stepick is with me. John, hello. Hello. I've just said that we talk about the attractiveness of the UK market. Now, I think that, you think that, Peter thinks that, some of our other guests think that, but actually still not very many other people think that, do they? They don't, but I have some very exciting news to share. Oh, goody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey has come out for June. Now, this basically shows where global fund managers around the world say that they're putting their money. I mean, maybe they're not putting their money there, but I don't see why they would lie on the survey. So, and it tends to be very useful as a contrarian thing. So if everyone, if something's popular, then quite often that will then fall. And if something's very unpopular, quite often it will then go up. The UK has been really unpopular on this survey for a very long time. And in March, it was the most underweighted stock market in the world as far as global fund managers were concerned. So basically the most hated. Then in April, it was the second most hated. May, the third most hated. And now in June, we've climbed to the fourth most hated in the world. I think that's that's quite a, a, there's momentum there. There is momentum there and there's momentum in the market as well. You know, it's going up and, you know, we always say about fund managers, they're all momentum investors. So if it's going up, they're, they're likely to buy it. But Don, I do just want to say, I think they do lie in that survey, you know. I think they do. Why do you think that? Well, I think that if something's going up and it's not in their portfolio, they probably still say they hold it, don't you think? Oh, okay, I see what you mean. They say it's almost a mix of what we uh, own and what we wish we owned. Yes, it's a, it's it's both things, you know. Do yeah. you ever talk to? A, I mean, you very rarely talk to a fund manager who says, "Oh, yeah, you know, that went up, but I didn't have any of it." It's not like that. <laughs> That's not how it works in the mind of a fund manager. They're all really, really good at what they do, and most of them are adequate at what they do, right? But in their minds, they're heroes, not just adequate. Different. I think. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. I can see why they would lie in that context. So a lot of it is about what 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 they'd like now. I wanted to talk a little bit about, about politics. I know we're all beginning to get bored of it. But increasingly, I listened to Keir Starmer saying that he's not going to put up this tax and not going to put up that tax and not going to change this and not going to do anything. Blah, blah. And I think, well, what is the point? What's the point in having a super majority and everybody's support if you don't actually do something? And I was reading um, a nice little note comes from these people at uh, Claremont, man called Chris Andrew writes these nice little notes I get. And uh, he reminded me of this, that there was a supermajority in 1945, of course, when Clement Attlee got in, right? Mm. 1944, no one could have anticipated that we were going to end up with the amazing or vast or not amazing, however you like to look at it, but the welfare state, the National Health Service, always amazing, not amazing, depending on how you look at it, nationalization of coal, nationalization of rail, nationalization of the Bank of England, the building of a million new homes, massive rise in inheritance tax, but effectively kind of crippled the class system, right? A massive amount of change. And since then, his point is, since then, what has really changed? You know, we just fiddle around. There's been no massive change to the way you could get it run. No massive change to the tax system. It's just this up a little bit, that down a little bit, this up a little bit, move this here, move that there, expand this. It hasn't been anything new and, and dramatic. We're all just, and this is his quote, we've been moving the plates and cutlery around on Mr. Atlee's table. And now we're about to, I know, funny, right? Now we're about to have a government, or it feels like we're about to have a government unless, uh, you know, we have a, 
It's the most historically useless polling ever. We're about to have a supermajority for a new government. And their approach to it right now is, oh, we're not really going to do anything. No changes to income tax, no changes to corporation tax. And today we had, and we're not going to be touching council tax either. Don't worry. Mm. And no CGT on your main home, etc. Now, I'm not saying that I want any of those taxes to go up. Of course I don't. You know, I'm, I'm a low tax person. But I'm sort of bemused by the sense that there's no vast change planned. I mean, that piece that it mentioned what Labour promised in the 1944 manifesto as opposed to what they actually did. Because I can't That's help. too much detail for me. Well, I guess my point is, so somebody said the other day on Twitter, oh, how come a party that's clearly polling 20% ahead of the other party and is going to, you know, trounce them is being so tentative about their manifesto promises? And I just thought they tweeted back, well, Remember 2017 and Theresa May was literally 20 points ahead in the polls and then she came along with, again, what was probably one of the most progressive attempts to address, you know, the big elephant in the room of social care whenever mm. we're all mm. old. And it got branded as a dementia tax and she ended up it ended up being a hung parliament. Um, so I think if... I think politicians have taken a few lessons in recent years and they've all been really bad ones. Um, they took the lesson from that that you shouldn't tell the electorate any difficult truths ever um, and the other lesson they took which is wrong is uh, from Liz Truss which is the idea that we now need to run everything by the OBR and make sure that we don't go a pound over a completely made up budget um, or else you know the bond vigilantes are going to come and cave our heads in with their invisible baseball bats which is also complete ho uh, nonsense so um, I, I just think that they are they are playing it really, really, really careful, which also worries me because then I don't know what they're going to come out with after the election and it may actually be really kind of bad. That's the worry, that there is actually a plan, that there is actually a plan. Um, OK, I have the uh, 1945 manifesto right here. Freedom, 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 full employment, freedom, freedom. The whole of the national resources in land, material and labour must be fully employed. Production must be raised to the highest level, blah, blah, blah. This is the equivalent to Keir Starmer wibbling away about growth endlessly. And then we get down to planned investment in essential industries on houses, schools and hospitals. Again, we're all very Keir. Uh, Bank of England with its financial powers must be brought under public ownership. So you talk the truth about I that. Was there. Uh, yeah, it was there. And then after that, uh, yeah, a lot of blast. Socialism cannot come overnight as a product of a weekend revolution. So yes, no, public transport of all inland transport, public ownership of all inland transport, sorry, public ownership of all the fuel and power industries, public ownership of iron and steel, uh, public supervision of all monopolies and cartels, the shaping of suitable economic and price controls. Um, then there's more. I mean, this is pretty open, right? But I suppose was was there anything there that would have worried the electorate at the time beyond uh, you know, power groups, and maybe that's the problem now. No, nah, it all sounds pretty good. I mean, apart from the the relentless nationalisations, you know, who who could stand against the creation of a welfare state, and who could stand against uh, the creation of a health service? And of course, the UK already had a health service. Everyone didn't just die in the streets if they um, if they got sick. A health service existed. Um, this was just a massive expansion of that health service. Shuffling the crockery and Clement Attlee's table does sound a little bit sweeping. I mean, you know, we don't still have nationalised. Uh, you know, like nationalised everything. You know, the few things have have moved back into the private sector, and um, you know, the the kind of the big bang in the city and all that sort mm, of stuff. Mm. Um, it feels a, a little bit over the top to say that nothing's changed since then. I think actually quite a few things have changed. I always ask you this, but I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> if you were here, what's the big change? What is it? But I mean, I do always actually come back to the land value tax. You do. You really do, John. You've got to write on it, or we've got to write on it. We've we got do. to have a podcast on things. Land I think value we should tax. have a podcast on it because I think that it would be an interesting one to discuss with people who could articulate beyond the practical 
element yep. of getting it into power, why it would be a bad idea, even if it worked. If you're an expert on the land value tax, get in touch with us. John and I are a little bit expert on it. We've written about it a lot over the years, but we could do with an external expert. Now, one thing that we, I think we can pretty sure of, we listened to Keir Starmer yesterday, the day before, tell us that um, he wasn't going to put up any taxes on working people who he ended up defining as the roughly 30% of the population who don't have savings. So that tells us pretty clearly <laughs> where the taxes are going to go up, right? And absolutely anybody with any savings or any wealth at all. I've been writing about this and I've actually got a column out um, or coming out, which has in it the details of the one tax loophole for the very high income that he will never be able to close. Going to leave you hanging on that one. Ooh, I look forward to doing that. Yeah. Welcome to Merrin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Merrin Somerset Webb. Here's my conversation with Peter Kinsella, Global Head of SX Strategy at Union Boncare Privé. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Really pleased to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. So a few weeks ago, you came over all bullish on the UK stock market, right? So tell us about that. When why? Sure. Well, I guess really to start, we've got a watch list that we look at, um, you know, a global watch list on our, our discretionary portfolios. Mm-hmm. And for the longest time, you know, the, the UK has been screening cheap, right, for, for a variety of reasons. But being cheap in and of itself isn't an, an immediate reason to go out and buy something, right? Mm. Um, you need a, a, a catalyst or a series of catalysts in order to change that paradigm and, and to see sort of some, some incremental increase in valuations. And when we looked at the UK, just from the valuation perspective, we saw you know that FTSE 100 trading with a PE of around 10, 45% of the constituents trading with a PE below 10, and we said, okay, it's it's absolutely cheap, you know. Uh, and certainly, we'd seen elsewhere, you know, kind of eight weeks ago or thereabouts, um, you know, in early March, mid March. The S&P doing pretty well, but also, I would say, some evidence of the equity rally widening, in a sense. And that coincided with an improvement in global PMI data, particularly in the service side and then latterly in the the manufacturing side. So it seemed to us that the the recovery, globally speaking, was doing a bit better than the consensus narrative. And we said, okay, well, from a growth perspective, how does the UK look? And we believe that, looking at the data, it was going to be a relatively shallow recession in, in Q4 last year. And coming to this year, you know, our view was that Inflation was falling quite rapidly. Energy prices had normalized in a very substantial manner. And if we looked at wage growth, we were looking at nominal wage growth in the region of sort of six, even you know, touching 7% in some sectors. In the context of having headline inflation, which will probably average around 3%-ish, maybe 2.6% this year. And so when you look at that, that basically tells you we're going to have positive real wage growth in the UK for the remainder of the year. We said, okay, that's quite interesting, you know, and, and knowing the Brits the way the way we do, you know, the Brits like to spend money. We then looked at sort of some of the, uh, you know, the earnings expectations and the guidance. And again, it wasn't absurd. And so, in a sense, we looked at a very, very cheap equity market, a, you know, potential growth improvement, you know, obvious growth improvement, and indeed a, a potential for a sort of, a, I would say, a, a resumption of consumer spending. Those two were two pretty inter- interesting catalysts. So when you say rising real wages, increasing consumer spending, which would lead to earnings surprises on the upside for consumer stocks. Yeah, yeah. And, for, that, would, and that would be a catalyst. For sure. For and um, that was kind of one of the strong reasons. The, the other reason then was we, we looked at the, the politics uh, in the UK. And what was kind of interesting, I think, was that coming into the election, we said, okay, Labour victory, that seems to be baked in the cake. And and if you look at it, you know, one of the issues with UK and sterling denominated assets is that they have traded with a certain risk premium since Brexit, um, since the Brexit referendum in, in 2016. And if you kind of look at it, comparatively speaking, you're seeing the rest of Europe move towards the right-ish, centre-right, to some extent on um, extreme right. And in the UK, we're kind of moving back towards centre-left, albeit a a more corporatist, managerial-style centre-left, I would say. And so it it says to me that if we get a Labour victory, they tend to normally want better relations with the EU. And so whilst I, I'm not expecting, you know, uh, anybody rejoining the EU's customs union or, or a single market or anything like that, there is a prospect of incremental improvements towards the overall relationship with the EU, which didn't and, and indeed doesn't exist with the cons- current Conservative administration. So that, that was definitely a positive cat- potential catalyst as well. And so looking at that all together, I said to myself, right, you know, we're cheap, we've got a couple of more catalysts, you know, and, uh, and that's why it starts to look, um, look a lot more interesting. 
Okay, let me just ask you then. You say that previous to this, you, you hadn't been interested in the UK, but what does that mean for your clients' portfolios? Because one of the things that has happened over the last couple of decades is the very rapid fall in the percentage of, a, of an average wealth management portfolio that is allocated to the UK, right? So it used to be 40, 50% if we go about a couple of decades, and now it's come down very dramatically. So when you say you weren't putting clients into the UK, does that mean that they were all holding the proportion relative to the MSCI World Index or nothing? I would say closer to nothing. The, the UK has been a very hard sell for a very long time. And I think if we look at it comparatively speaking again, I think the proportion, it, it fell to as low as 6%, I think, in, in globally weighted uh, portfolios. But, you know, from, from our discretionary portfolios, we, we basically held little to nothing in, in, in the UK. And one of the anecdotes to, to give an, an idea of how hard the UK has been in, in terms of, you know, investing. I recently met, met uh, one of the advisors to, I think it was the Minister for Investment at the Department of Business and Trade, Lord Donald Johnson. And speaking with this, this advisor, I was saying, how do you market the UK at the moment and uh, our things? And he said, uh, it's a really hard sell and, and has been so for the last few years, particularly following Brexit. So in a sense, that kind of gives you an idea of the, the external perception of the UK. It, it has been a hard sell. You know, obviously, politically, we've had some difficulties here in, in, in the UK. And certainly that filters through towards, you know, an investor perception. And so it's definitely been a hard sell. And even interestingly, when, you know, when we, we put this in front of our, you know, clients, investors, other people, um, we got significant pushback. And I think what's interesting from, from this is that, you know, this is, to my mind at least, when you get huge pushback on an investment uh, thesis or rationale, oftentimes that's the very time of the greatest upside, right? Because mm. it's a non-consensual view. And uh, and certainly that's 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 been the way it has traded. The UK has traded pretty well. FTSE's done pretty well in the last three to four months. And I certainly think there's a, there's an awful lot more upside um, in the months and years ahead. When you get pushback, I'm quite interested in this, when you get pushback, what is it that people say? Because obviously they can't say it's not cheap. Because that's it's, not the case. So what they what can they say? There's too much political volatility there for me. We, uh, Brexit, Brexit has destroyed the economy. What, what, what is the pushback? Because obviously there's now political volatility absolutely everywhere. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a volatile, volatile government, you can find them pretty much anywhere you like in Europe. And the US isn't exactly looking like a beacon of stability. So what is the pushback against the UK? We just don't like Brexit. It makes us feel uncomfortable. That's probably part of it. I think really Brexit was one aspect of it. Certainly the shenanigans, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the Liz Truss budget, um, you mm -hmm. know, sort of going on two years ago, that's definitely affected people's um, judgment. Yeah, uh, but that's not really relevant to this because this all happened long before that. We're going back to 2016 when the UK discount stuff first arrived, right? The Liz Truss debacle was extremely short, uh, fixed very quickly. Um so it just it just seems to me that if you're talking to rational, intelligent investors, it's very hard to understand what the pushback is unless it's simply an emotional prejudice of some kind that seemingly rational people can't seem to drop. Yeah, I think there's definitely a kernel of truth in that. I wouldn't doubt that at all. And I think really just the mood music around the UK from an external perspective has just been poor, right? And it's our job, obviously, to, to be as, as dispassionate as possible about that and, and to simply look at the actual investment thesis and the rationale and, and, and the potential for upside. And so, you know, when we chewed through it, we said to ourselves, right, that there are definitely worse places to put our money. And uh, certainly it's, it's, it's been rewarding thus far, um, as I've said, and I think it will continue to be the case. It's in the same box in a sense as, as Japan was maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, in the sense that lots of companies trading way below their book value, decent improvement in earnings, which we've seen for sure in Japan, and which I think we're going to see here in the UK as well. And so you put that together, you've got a reasonably impressive thesis uh, or investment outlook. Again, I think that the, the pushback really for me was just a hangover from Brexit. Um, and it's, it's probably not helped, I think, by the fact that most of the world's financial media is conducted through the English language and based in London. And so we kind of get a, um, you know, this very negative slant on the UK. And so one thing that I've always noticed is that locals tend to be far more bearish on their own um, economy than elsewhere. Perhaps it's the case that familiarity breeds contempt, I'm not, I'm not too sure. But, uh, but nonetheless, I think that's definitely played a role in, in sort of affecting people's judgment. Well, that's kind of interesting. Now, I want to come back to Japan in, in a minute, but let's stick with, with the UK for now. First, a quick question. What, do, what are you moving money out of to move it into the UK? In an average portfolio, what are you selling to, to get up to? And what percentage of the portfolio is now in the UK? Right. So I, I guess really we had some, some EM holdings, which we reduced at the margin. We thought some of those had a, a pretty good run. And that's what, what we were doing just to, to get into the UK. And so that, that's really what we did. We still have a core holding, obviously, in, in, in the US. And, you know, we quite 
review the, pe- the tech names and, and so on. But overall, that, that's, that was the, the modest change which we, which we undertook. So it was literally just pairing back a little bit of EM exposure towards an increase in, in UK exposure. Okay. And when we talk about UK exposure, there's a, a million different ways to get UK exposure. And more precisely, what is it that you'd put into a portfolio these days? Is it, is it small caps where the real value looks or uh, higher up where you can get the yield? Yeah, I suppose we did. We did more, more, more so on the small cap side, simply because we thought we'd weigh more upside from a, simply from a value pro, uh, proposition. I think also the fact that given that the thesis was that UK consumer spending w- w- would improve over the remainder of the year, that's going to be less of a, um, I would say, an impetus for the, the you know, the, the FTSE 100 to do well, right? Because that's largely speaking externally facing a stock market, and so consequently we were much, much more uh, inclined to look at the FTSE 250 and to look at some of the constituent names there. And indeed, that, that's been okay. And certainly, there's a couple of decent managed funds, which have done well. You've got the Joe Hambro Fund, which, was, which has done uh, pretty well this year. That's going to be an interesting outlook there. One, one of the things that we, we looked at, is, which has kind of confirmed the thesis, is that you've got in, increasing numbers of takeovers of UK companies, right? And that, to my mind, tells us that a lot of external players think this place is simply too cheap. Yeah. And the market is beginning to look interesting again, partly on that valuation basis, partly the M&A, and partly that we're beginning to hear a lot of talk about an interesting pipeline of IPOs into the end of the year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, starting with the potential Sheen valuation, which which will be good and, and certainly would help what has been a very, I would say, moribund IPO market here in the UK and, and indeed elsewhere for the last year or two. But certainly in the UK, it's it's selling London as a, a listing venue has been tricky for the last couple of years. But, you know, look, it's an agglomeration exercise as well, right? You know, the more names that we get listing here, the, the more that will come. And so, yep. uh, you know, that, I think that's definitely good news from, from the UK's perspective. OK, so lots of good news. Very good. But... But uh, you talked about the positive implications of a big Labour majority, uh, possibly uh, better relationships with Europe and the stability that might come with a big majority. But there's also, of course, potential negatives here because a Labour government with a big majority has an awful lot of power and may do all sorts of things that don't feel particularly market or particularly business friendly. So there may be a a sugar rush post-election and then a rather nasty come down eight months to a year out. Could be. Um, it would depend very much on what, what the what the government, what they, you know, the incoming administration are, are going to do, right? Now, if, if we kind of, I suppose, we take a bit of altitude and, and look at what they're they're doing, they're pretty much going to, as far as we can tell, remain more or less within the fiscal parameters that the current government are, are doing, right? So. You know, no huge increase in net net borrowing. I would say some marginal increases in taxation. We've certainly seen, you know, in the last several days, um, I would say some talk about potential increases in CGT. So that's capital gains tax for, to, for your listeners. And you've got obviously a couple of other tax raising measures. So that's go- going to come in bits and pieces. Uh, vis-a-vis the spending, if we look at the current administration, they, they do see or foresee in their forecasts a pretty, I would say, notable uh, decrease in spending in the, coming into in the fifth year of, of the administration. So so, you know, spending cuts are, are going to come one way or the other. Depends how they're, they're simply distributed. But broadly speaking, it seems that the, the incoming Labour administration intends to pursue a similarly or similar uh, fiscal metric to the, the current uh, Conservative administration, which basically means we're going to stop borrowing or increasing borrowing within three to four years. OK, and you're not concerned about things like, oh, I don't know, a, a wealth tax or a rising CGT putting people off going into the stock market. All these kinds of things. This is a very nascent recovery and easily shocked. You One could argue that, yeah. I, th- I think on the wealth tax side of things, I mean, um, certainly wealth taxes are very difficult to implement. And that's been the, I would say, I would say the history in, in, they don't tend to generate all that much revenue, if, if I'm frank. I think uh, Switzerland has a, has a wealth tax, which I think comes to around 4% of, of the total taxation um, pot. So, okay, not minuscule, but it's not a game changer either, I would argue. Again, that's been in place for a very long time. Here in the UK, look, even setting up a wealth tax is going to take a long time. You're going to have to figure out who you're going to tax, how you're going to tax them. Is it just property? What about overseas assets, etc.? That's tricky. And coming on top of, the, of what they're doing vis vis non doms, it's already becoming, I don't want to say an unfriendly place for, for, for capital, but you don't want to make it less friendly. Capital gains tax, of course, is effectively a wealth tax in the UK because it's not indexed to inflation. Yep. So because it's not indexed to inflation, you are taxed on nominal gains rather than real gains. So it is already a wealth tax. And the longer you hold an asset, the more of a wealth tax it becomes, right? So if the rate of capital gains tax is raised, we have effectively implemented a sharp rise in, a, in an existing wealth tax. And you could say the same, for example, of uh, the very high level of stamp duty that we charge on our stock market. So, you know, we charge one of the highest stamp duties in the world on, on 
on uh, equity transactions. That's a wealth tax. Of course, it's a wealth tax. And uh, then we have inheritance tax, which is also a wealth tax. In fact, if you add up all our wealth taxes, we already tax wealth rather more highly than almost anywhere else in Europe. Yeah. The funny thing is that, you know, what you said is, is a particularly cogent, coherent view. And it's not something which we really hear in the media all that much, apart from odd bits in, in financial media. It certainly doesn't get into the mainstream media that we have already, you know, I, I would argue, a pretty heavy burden of wealth taxation, be it real or nominal. And, and so I think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the d potential design of a, of a wealth tax, look, it, it would take an awful lot of time to do so. My view, at least, is that you know, a, a, a if you're going to reform anything, would be to reform stamp duty on on housing, you know, lower it substantially, but then increase potentially some of the, the ongoing monthly payments because. What that does is that it gives you a much more stable revenue profile longer out, right, from a government perspective. And, you, you know, your fiscal setup isn't subject to the vagaries of, uh, of the property market, which, you know, have been very, very volatile here in the UK for quite some time. Yeah. Are there any policies that you see coming that we haven't discussed yet that might have an effect? So I think what's going to be interesting from Labour is what they do on pensions here in the UK. And it's been interesting that if you listen to the Conservative administration, you know, they want to increase pension payments, keeping the triple lock, etc. And I'm not so sure how long that line can hold, right? Because if you're going to distribute pain across your economy or across your, your society, everybody's got to give relative to where they are in life. And I don't see how it's tenable that the wealthiest cohort in the population are given, after inflation, real value gains in in, uh, in pensions and everybody else is getting cuts. And then not only about the, the equity argument of that, when you look at just the, the bread and butter of it, the pension spending here in the UK is, is, is significant. And if you're spending money on that, you're not spending money on infrastructure. So I could see definitely, if push came to shove, I could see a Labour administration potentially moving in that way because certainly they've got the numbers to do it or will have in the next parliament. And we worry a little here about um, financial repression expressed by the capturing of pension assets for infrastructure spend. It's a worry. I think it's twofold. It'll probably come down the line in one form or another. The bigger issue here in the UK, and probably actually in most Anglo-Saxon economies, is that we're very bad at infrastructure and we're very bad at implementing it and, and paying for it in the sense that we probably pay double what our continental cousins pay for, for even road building or building train lines and, and everything else. Now, in the UK, people will say, well, that there's very idiosyncratic reasons for that. It's because of the planning system. It's that or the other. It's a lack of expertise when it comes to drafting contracts. But nonetheless, I think what's pretty clear to me is that there's, there's definitely some efficiency gains to be made there. And the Labour um, Party has talked quite, I would say, strikingly about its intention to reform the planning system. Definitely necessary. I think anybody with half a brain cell in the UK would agree. The planning system here is grossly difficult to, to navigate. Anybody even doing the, the most basic of things, be it an extension to a house or, or, or more, more severe infrastructural projects, they're just caught up in red tape for years in many cases. And that has significant costs, but it also has um, a significant cost on our productivity in the UK. It's no secret that UK productivity growth has been astonishingly poor for the last you know, 12, 15 years. And I think a, a big part of that is the fact that our infrastructure does, isn't where it should be. And when we do get it, it comes in at a cost which is far uh, above what, where it should be. So th there are some tremendous gains to be made there. And I, I don't think they should be um, discounted in any sense, because if we do get a, an efficient planning regime, it could really be a game changer for the UK. Mm. Well, it's planning and it's regulation, isn't it? I mean, the number that always sticks in my head every time we talk about infrastructure, every time we talk about building anything major in the UK is 7,000 because that was the number of changes re required for the design of Hinkley Point for it to be built in the UK. 7,000 7, changes for a, a plant that can be built anywhere else without the 7,000 changes. And that's how we manage to make everything cost double, quadruple what it costs anywhere else in the world. God, we're very good at, at, at that bit. Indeed. And I think a big part, big part of that is just the use of external consultants, right, on, on many of these projects. So one of the things that we, we don't have in the UK, and again, we don't have in, in a great many other Anglo-Saxon countries, is a ministry for infrastructure. <laughs> and yeah. I think there's yeah. a very strong case to be made uh, for, for having one, because we end up in a situation where we employ external consultants, they have to justify their existence, and you therefore end up with X, Y, Z, 7,000 changes being made mm. to what are, you know, I don't want to say basic designs, but, you know, which 
approach of designs which, which have been standardized in other parts of the world. You know, in that context, there's definitely tremendous scope, I think, for improvements when it comes to the infrastructure, um, both the planning, the execution thereof. Okay, I think we better leave that because we're going to get ourselves both bogged down and Certainly irritated. Would. Yeah, so let's move on to Japan where they will have um, some troubles with infrastructure, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the market now. You and I were both uh, very keen on the Japanese market a couple of years back and it has unfolded pretty much as one might have expected. The changes to corporate governance, the valuations, the interest from outside Japan, the domestic investors coming back in again, P activist interest, etc. So Japan has done very well over the last couple of years. What do you see happening now? Are we done here or is there a good few years to come? Oh, there's a good few years to come. No, no question in my mind. I think there's a few things that are going on. So you've seen if you look at the P ratio on, say, the Nikkei 225, I think you're roughly 17 or 18 at, at present. So not as cheap as it was, but by no means um, super expensive. If, we, if you look at, say, the Nasdaq's earning profile in terms of year-on-year -year growth and earnings, since 2010, Nikkei's more or less done the same. Uh, as topics, right? So you've seen a very material improvement in the earnings growth and earnings quality of uh, of Japanese corporates, and it's not related to to the weakening in the end, right? Th this is these are just corporate profitability improvements. So that's an ongoing issue. Will continue to be the case. Um, a lot of these are externally facing companies, so it's, you're not just reliant upon the Japanese consumer. And I think in in that context, that can, that will definitely continue to be the case. We still have, I would say, a substantial gains to be made from the improvement in corporate governance. The reforms under Abe they took a long time to take effect. I think that would probably be a fair point, but they're still manifesting very you know slowly but surely. And so in that sense, it says to me, right, we're, we're looking at an environment in which big efficiency improvements, really asking companies about how to justify their cost of capital, much more activist activist investors, and a still decent earnings profile. And if I look at it, they're doing that in a currency which is astonishingly cheap, right? So if I look at the Japanese yen, it's trading pretty much at its lowest level in real effective exchange rate terms than I can ever remember in a 20-year career. So you're buying good companies with good earnings profile in a currency which is probably 30 to 40% undervalued. It's a bit of a no-brainer in my opinion. Okay, so you do think the yen is that undervalued, oh, and sure. you think it will, and it will strengthen from yeah, here. For sure, for sure. One of the big things you've seen in Japan in recent years is Chinese um, entrepreneurs, investors, buying hotels in Japan, and they were doing that during the during the pandemic, um, and that's both a reflection of one, you know, obviously their outlook on tourism, but also a reflection of the fact that they simply thought the yen was too cheap, and um, it continues to be way too cheap, in my opinion. Okay, so um, our listeners who invest in Japan now will get hopefully the equity upside and the currency upside for sure. as well. For sure. Yeah, you've got, I mean, look, on dollar yen, you'll get it by standing still in, in the sense that once we see the Fed beginning to, to cut interest rates and some slowing in US growth uh, metrics in the second half of the year, US 10 year yield will stabilize. And if and when it stabilizes, dollar yen obviously is not going to go higher. <laughs> I'll put it to you that way. Okay. And what about the pound? I know that you were fairly bullish on the pound. Uh, well, six, seven weeks ago, you wrote about that. And obviously, the pound's had a reasonable run since. Where are we now? Yeah, basically, I had a piece in the FT, um, which I wrote basically more or less the same time as we did our equity piece. And my argument at the time was that sterling was set to rally. It has rallied since. I think it's done 2 or 3% in, in trade-weighted terms. But my rationale at the time was pretty simple, was that we were going to get a positive real rate spread in the, in the UK and sterling for the first time in a very long time, okay? And that is unusual for sterling because, you know, sterling has had a flat to negative real rate profile for the longest time ever. Um, the second thing was that I noticed that the UK current account deficit had contracted quite aggressively um, to sort of below sort of 2% of GDP. That, to my mind, was very interesting because, again, the, the narrative following Brexit, oh, you know, we're looking at a triple deficit economy, current account deficit, fiscal deficit, capital account deficit, etc. And this contraction in the current account deficit is interesting because it does tell you that certainly the, the currency has far less pent up depreciation pressure than would be the case if it had a large current account deficit. That was an interesting one. And then I think certainly the removal of UK idiosyncratic political risk. If you're seen to have an administration which will be a little bit more pro-Europe, or at least, let's say, less antagonistic towards the EU, that's definitely good for sterling. And thus far, that's that seems to be um, playing out pretty well. Interesting. Do you think the, the recent government has been explicitly antagonistic towards the uh, EU? Uh, I would say not antagonistic. Or, the, or possibly the other way around. Yeah, quite possibly the other way around. But but certainly, I think it improved under Sunak, certainly with the Windsor framework. I think that was definitely a, a big plus. But certainly, I think until we get, I would say, politically stable, coherent UK government, one which can actually be relied upon, 
to do what they're going to say. Until that happens, U- UK will, with Sterling at least, would continue to have some form of a, a political risk premium. And how politically coherent does the EU look at the moment? A little upset there. <laughs> well, I think we'll, we'll know in three weeks after the French election, won't we? Look, I would say, I think it must be a fascinating time to be a, a political scientist. I'm sure they're, they're finding a lot to talk about. You've seen right-wing parties go from, extreme right-wing parties, go from f- polling 5% five years ago to nearly 25% in, in the recent elections. How are we defining extreme right-wing? Well, well that's, that's a, you know, anti-immigration, et, et cetera. Uh, and, and I do find that interesting in the sense that... Okay, hang on. No, we've got, we got to go back. we got to go back. Is being anti-immigration extreme right-wing? I wouldn't. Personally, I wouldn't. But that seems to be what they're called. That seems to be the nomenclature at the moment. Okay. But anyway, it is a movement. One, one can say that. Yep. Well, I think what's super interesting is that it's gone from 5 to 25% in the European uh, parliamentary elections, mm-hmm. where if you look at, say, the Green Party has been stuck at between 5 and 8% for the last 40 years, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. So you are seeing some very significant changes in, in Europe's polit- political makeup. I think there's, there's no question about that. Is the centre holding? Yes, for the moment. But, you know, you're, you're definitely seeing a big shift in terms of the political governance, in, in at least in Europe. Whether that leads, leads to changes in from a policy perspective, not entirely sure. But for sure, you're going to get, I think, from the EU, probably a more cogent and coherent response towards migration. I think that's kind of going to come down the line. OK, but for the moment, you'd rather hold the pound, pound than the euro. Yeah, for sure. At least until the you know the, the UK election and probably until September, we'll see how things go. Okay, let's stick with currencies for the moment and talk about the ultimate currency, the currency of all currencies, the king of currencies, gold. Now, normally yeah. we wait until the very end of the podcast for this and we just ask, would you choose gold or Bitcoin if you had to hold something for a decade? And uh, most people say gold, some people say Bitcoin, but I'm going into it now because I know that you, you are a genuine gold bug, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, as a bank, obviously, you know, be, being a private bank, gold is a big component of, of what we do. And certainly, yeah, I think if I compare gold to Bitcoin, and obviously I would vote for gold in, in that, that sense. I started looking at Bitcoin in 2011. You know, it's a good 13 years ago. And at the time, it had any number of reasons why to buy it. You know, you know it's going to be the new money, ease of transaction, da da da, store value, da da. And truth be told, it's done nothing. I make the analogy: of, if Bitcoin is the answer, then what's the question? Yeah, we've asked that on this podcast <laughs> yeah. before, and we do get various questions, but none of them are ones that we consider to be life changing. Yeah, so far, it, so far. You know, we, we struggle with it, and so I, I don't really get what it does. I don't think I don't really see what it's replacing, and is it doing so in a more efficient manner? I would say no at the moment. Peter, I must interrupt to ask: you started looking at it in two thousand eleven. Mm-hmm. Did you buy any? I didn't. More's a pity. <laughs> Yeah, um, never mind. I didn't, Moving I, on. I didn't because I didn't believe in it. Uh, yeah. And I still don't. And I won't buy it. <laughs> so you could argue that both ways. But um, you, don't ha- you don't have to believe in stuff to let it make you rich, you know? Yeah, Belief yeah. is not required. It, it isn't for everybody, but I like to. I, I like to really know what I'm buying, personally speaking. And I like to really sort of, uh, buy it. Because, look, if, if you make money, great. But if you, if you make mistakes, you're making them for the right reasons or, or you learn from it. But um, on go, look, I think there's a few things to say. The, the first is that we're seeing an explosion in debt and deficits in developed market economies, right? And that historically has been dealt with through one of two ways, either inflation or through some form of default. You have obviously increasing populism in many Western economies. You've got governments which seem to have simply just forgotten about why deficits matter and debt matters. And as a result of that, I think people look at gold and they think, okay, if you know, if all these promises about repaying this debt don't, you know, don't come true, probably makes some sense to have some gold. You've got to look at what central banks are doing. Central banks have added over a thousand tons of physical gold each year, 2022, 23, and going on to this year as, as well as most likely, which is probably three times the pre-2022 rate. So central banks, primarily, by the way, emerging market central banks, are buying gold. And, and that tells you something. It tells you that they are less convinced about the ability of various governments to repay um, debt. It tells you that they're worried about geopolitics. It tells you, they were, you know, that they're worried. And in that context, I think you've got an increase in structural demand for, for gold. You obviously got an increase in gold from uh, on the consumer side, particularly in China, which we saw this year, which I think is probably a very intelligent hedge from by local people on the currency and the yuan, and also indeed a, probably a, an alternative asset to the local domestic uh, property market. So overall, I think there, there are very good reasons to buy gold. There are new buyers in, in town, and structurally speaking, I think you're adding uh, incremental increases in demand into what is still largely a fixed supply, um, and that means the price is only going to go one way, it's going to go higher. 
And how do you hold it? On a banking level, we do via ETF um, or, or people can do via, um, via holding physical. I think from my perspective, look, if you're a, a more tactical investor, doing a via ETFs is a great way because it's simply more liquid and easier to do mm-hmm. and probably with substantially lower transaction costs. So that's how I do it personally. And what about other precious metals, silver, platinum, etc.? We have a lot of listeners who are very interested in silver. Look, I would say the following. Silver historically is traded with a high beta to gold. And um, if we look at it in the last year, it actually underperformed gold pretty much until late March this year, uh, April. And then it really rallied big time. It went from roughly $26 per ounce all the way up to 32. I think we're trading around 29 at the moment. But I think the outlook is, is still pretty good. If you think that the gold silver ratio gets back to historical levels, it's kind of 68 or, or 70, that puts silver firmly around 33 to $34 per ounce. And this is before we consider what's happening with vis-a-vis uh, silver's use in, in the photovoltaic se- sector, so basically in the, um, the solar sector, where if you look at any outlook over the, the longer term, the silver usage is, is looking to increase very substantially. So uh, on that basis alone, I think having some silver makes sense. I could easily see it going to 38, 40 bucks a, uh, an ounce pretty easily. The issue you've got to contend with as an investor is that its volatility is pretty high. Three-month implied vol in silver is probably historically in the region of 20-25%. So it's high. And consequently, if you're looking just to minimise vol in a portfolio, you've got to scale your bet accordingly. Gold it is then. Peter, is there anything else? Because I can't ask you the final question, gold or bitcoins, we've already done it. Um, So let me just ask you this. If you could take an asset, and it's not UK assets because we've discussed those, and it's not Japanese equities, we've discussed that. It's not one of the currencies we've discussed. And it's not gold and it's not bitcoin. What would be next on your list? Unquestionably, it would be copper. Oh, okay. Without question, would be copper. Yeah. Um, All right. Two minutes on copper. Thank you. It's a very, very simple outlook, right? We talk about green transition metals. And look, the truth of the matter, it's copper. Copper is the transition metal. And when you look at it, you've got very constricted supply. You've got various problems opening new copper mines, etc. It is unquestionably going to be a very substantial su- supply squeeze over the coming years. No question about that. And I do find it interesting just looking at open interest in the futures market. You've obviously seen huge volatility in, in recent weeks. But um, if we look at uh, if we look at as well some of the option trades that larger hedge funds are putting on. They're putting on strikes at twenty thousand dollars, you know, per ton, uh, where it's been trading at around sort of ten and twelve thousand per ton. It kind of gives you an idea of where clever, sharp money is going. So if there's one asset, you know, as discussed, that I wanted to buy or have bought, copper is definitely that that asset. Okay, but as a retail investor, just an ordinary investor, how on earth would you get a significant exposure to copper? You'd probably buy the future. That's that's the way to do it. Um, very very simple copper future, and then just let that run. Okay. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. John, how did you find that that conversation? Did it play to every single one of your prejudices? Uh, actually, pretty much. I, do you know what stood out to me most, actually, as I was reading it? And it's positive for our listeners, assuming that most of our listeners are uh, private investors. The thing that gets me is that everything that Peter was saying here about the UK... And sort of like, I get the impression that his conversion to it is relatively recent. And as long as you're willing to go against the broad opinion that the UK was in some way, you know, kind of just an absolute basket case because of the politics, then you could have acted on all this a lot earlier. Um, and I think that that points to the fact that if you're a you know someone who manages money for other people then as well as having good ideas you have to sell those ideas to the other people and so it's actually harder for you to act before there's already a kind of rationale and that's why asset managers are always talking about catalysts you know at the end of the day who really cares about a catalyst if you know if you're a long-term investor you know you, you, you can maybe invest like you know a year ahead of something actually happening um, you don't necessarily need to worry about, well, what's going to make this move in the next quarter because I'm going to get judged on the next quarter's figures. Yeah, well, you do if you're a fund manager, but you don't if you're us. This is, as we always say, the great advantage that the retail investor has over their professional investor is that we have time on our side and they absolutely don't. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I think that's, I think this, in a way, this whole conversation illustrates the benefit of being a retail investor because 
you you don't have to you know i mean these are all good ideas but like i said they were they've been good ideas for a wee while and you could have acted on them earlier as long as you weren't worrying about what anyone else thought of you it's interesting the way he says that um uh, that when presenting this these ideas to to clients he's still getting a lot of pushback well exactly yeah <laughs> you're kind of like, well, you know they're just you know. they're not they're not accepting it they're, they're looking at the market going up they're lying to the bank of american survey but you know in a <laughs> in a meeting in a meeting room they're still they're not having it they're not having it i i do think it's it's interesting actually to look at what's happening with france now as well so Macron's called a, you know, what everyone's calling a, you know, shock election, um, which as far as I can work out, he was going to have to call anyway because his budget wasn't going to get passed because that's the state of politics there. And everyone's seeing this sort of like spectre of uh, the, you know, the far right kind of coming and then selling first and asking questions later. But, but we know what happens here. You know, the European Central Bank has got all the powers it needs to do the same thing that central banks all across the world can do. Um, and it's just a matter of how messy the politics gets before things get ironed out yet again in the Eurozone. But because you bring the political element into it, there's this kind of, it's almost like the, the critical faculties shut down a bit. What did, what did you think about his views on, on Copper John? I mean, he was pretty clear on, on gold and Bitcoin. No, no mistaking what he felt there. But then he moved into a, I was very generous, wasn't I? I gave him the opportunity to suggest something else. And, uh, and he gave us copper. Now, we've heard, we've heard the copper story a lot. And that is one of the few areas in, of investment where I suspect there is a general consensus. Copper is a transition metal. Everyone should hold copper one way or another. It's one of those ones where I feel as if I've heard this story too many times and I need someone to come up with a more uh, detailed case for copper now because it feels like this is very much a consensus trade. And there's one thing, having a consensus trade in something like NVIDIA, which could go up you know, forever more because it's American and it's momentum, but copper's a commodity. Um, if there is an oversupply of it, and... and you know, the Chinese don't seem to be using an awful lot at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, there's lots of complexities around the supply and demand for commodities. And the and the big picture story of, oh, you know, data is the new oil, copper is the new is the new oil, is just, is too, it reminds me too much of peak oil. That was a great story when it started, but it was a terrible story to believe whenever it was, you know, about to end. And I feel that there's a risk that copper just now is in that situation. And I'm not, I'm not keen to just take the, the big picture theme. I'd need to delve into the details before I actually put my own money on it. Yeah, and we hit peak supply of oil every year these days, don't we? So peak oil, we we started writing about peak oil, I think, twenty years ago or something. Boy, were we ever wrong? But we mm. weren't wrong. The people who told us were wrong. What do we know about oil supplies? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and you'd only need a little kind of change in the direction of the energy transition for things to change. I mean, at the moment, we say everything is about copper because everything is about building the grid out. Everything is about new pylons. Everything is about new transmission lines, etc. What if, what if there was a shift, as I wrote in a column a few weeks ago, there was a shift to uh, localized nuclear plants? Then you wouldn't need so much copper. What if there was a shift to, someone was explaining to me about, um, about how, ammonia, how ammonia is used as an energy source and how transportable that is without the grid, etc. You know, if, if we're going down a wrong path at all, any pullback from that suddenly makes copper not the most important metal in the world. Now we're, we're moving way, way outside our knowledge base. I think we'd better stop. <laughs> good idea good idea stop Merrin before you get yourself in trouble anyway I, I enjoyed that conversation with Peter a lot I, I enjoyed having all my prejudices uh, confirmed for me nothing like a bit of confirmation bias in a podcast you know we've got to get on someone soon and again if this is you if this is you get in touch someone who absolutely hates the UK market thinks that we are structurally flawed to the extent that this market can never really come back that our big companies deserve to be on valuations of somewhere between 10 and 12 times and deserve to have dividend yields of you know seven eight nine ten percent because they're that awful they're just going to run down till they die someone who believes that give us a call we want to have the other view on 
Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money. We will be back next week. In the meantime, if you like our show, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. And keep sending questions or comments to merrymoney at bloomberg.net. This episode was hosted by me, Marin Somerset Webb. It was produced by Sam Asadi, additional editing by Moses and um, Special thanks to Peter Kinsella. And uh, just as a reminder, you can follow me and John on Twitter. I'm at Marin SW and John is at John underscore Stephanie.